in February of 1980, two-year-old Cassidy Johnson would be rushed to the emergency center by her parents for an unknown illness that was progressing extremely rapidly. While medical staff are trying to stabilize Cassidy, they notice that she has pretty severe bruising to her head and they think her mysterious illness might be coming from the head trauma that she has sustained. But according to Cassie's parents, nothing significant happened in the couple hours prior to her trip to the ER that would warrant the state that she is in, and unable to gather any more information, medical staff focus on doing everything they could to try and get Cassidy stabilized. But after exhausting all their efforts, two-year-old Cassidy would unfortunately pass away due to her sudden illness, her cause of death was officially listed as encephalitis or brain inflammation. After her death Cassidy's parents were especially confused as to how their healthy two-year-old daughter could have deteriorated so fast. They said they were out that night for a few hours having fun, enjoying time to themselves, and left Cassidy with their babysitter, 17-year-old Christine Falling, and when they left, Cassidy was her happy and bubbly self with no signs of illness. Christine had babysat for them a few times before and there had been no issues, so they trusted her, but this particular instance when they got home Christine would tell them that Cassidy had gotten really ill while they were out and she ended up falling from her crib. But children fall from their crib all the time with no serious injuries and Christine assured them that everything was fine, so Cassidy's parents thinking nothing serious is happening, sent Christine home and continued to take care of Cassidy throughout the evening, hoping she would be better by the next morning. Unfortunately, over the next four hours, Cassidy's condition rapidly worsened and they had no other choice but to take her to the emergency room. This was the story that everyone told to police when they were called, and because everyone seemed convinced this was an unfortunate accident, officers didn't suspect foul play as everybody's stories checked out. Even Christine's story was very consistent every time she told it, and it just seemed like this was an unfortunate accident that could have happened to any parent, and the case was soon closed and forgotten. And of course, with sudden incidents like this, Many people can't help but to blame themselves and be racked with guilt, especially for someone like 17-year-old Christine Falling. A child died in her care so it's understandable that Cassidy's death would make her feel incredibly guilt-ridden and traumatized. From the outside it appeared that she was so upset by the death of little Cassidy that she decided to move to Lakeland, Florida to get a fresh start. In Lakeland, she continued to babysit to make some extra money. Christine got along well with a lot of her neighbors and they trusted her, she seemed like such a sweet girl and she was very quickly able to build up some clientele. Then in May of 1980, only two months after she had moved to Lakeland, a 911 call would be placed, the caller would say that four-year-old Jeffrey Davis who they were babysitting, wasn't breathing and they needed an ambulance immediately. The paramedics quickly arrive ready to do everything they can to try and save Jeffrey, but unfortunately by the time they got there, he was already deceased and there was nothing they could do. Jeffrey's official cause of death would be listed as myocarditis, which is a disease of the heart caused by inflammation of the heart muscles. Symptoms include shortness of breath and heart failure, which outwardly matched Christine's description of how Jeffrey died and poor 17-year-old Christine Falling, she had been involved in the death of two toddlers, but in everyone's eyes the cause of death for both of these toddlers was natural, it wasn't caused by foul play, rough handling, or abuse, these were both just tragedies that Christine happened to be a witness to. At least that's what you want to believe, because the alternative is something too sinister for a 17-year-old to be involved in and as a parent it's far easier to justify that your child died of an unfortunate illness, rather than believing that you let the person who would kill your child into your home. But unbeknownst to everyone, Christine Falling was extremely mentally disturbed, and deranged, and she would go to claim the lives of six people before her 20th birthday. Christine had a very turbulent childhood, she showed very early signs of being a psychopath. She was born March 12, 1963, to her 16-year-old mother and, and in her 65-year-old father Thomas, 
she had one older sister and two younger brothers. And as you can tell from the family dynamic, there is already some very illegal stuff going on, and on top of that, Thomas was extremely abusive. After years of enduring Thomas's abuse, and would ultimately decide to abandon her entire family, she took all four of her children and left them on a park bench in front of the mall. Luckily for Christine and her older sister Carol, a family friend stepped up to take care of them temporarily, then the pair soon got adopted by the Fallings, which is who they got their names from. But this home was also very hectic for Christine and the Fallings, as they came to realize Christine had a number of health issues like regular seizures, in addition to extreme learning disabilities which made her very hard to manage. But the problems didn't end here. As Christine got older, she began to display more worrying behaviors, she would have extreme fits of anger, and began showing signs of antisocial personality disorder. From a very young age one of Christina's favorite pastimes would be torturing cats. She was obsessed with testing whether or not they really had nine lives. To test her theories, she would either drop them from really high places or strangle them to see if they would survive or come back to life. And even though her personal theories were never proven, it didn't deter her from trying, and many people speculate that these behaviors escalated due to physical and sexual abuse inflicted upon Christine in the home. Allegedly, there was one time when her adoptive father Jesse Falling would subject her to a severe beating just for being 10 minutes late from school when she was just 12 years old. Unable to take any more of the abuse, Christine and her sister Carol would run away from home the very next day. They tracked down their birth mother and, and started living with her again. But by this point, the damage to Christine's psyche was already done. Once at her mother's she just kept spiraling into worse habits and weirder behaviors. After two years of living with him, Christine would end up marrying a man at the age of 14 who was in his 20s. It was rumored that this man was actually related to her in some way and he could have possibly been a stepbrother. But this marriage didn't end up lasting long as it was also filled with a lot of physical abuse. They were only married for six weeks before they ended up getting divorced. And after this failed marriage, for some reason, Christine started to develop Munchausen syndrome, which is a mental disorder where somebody will fake an illness, or in extreme cases will actually make themselves sick through things like poisoning just to get attention and sympathy. This syndrome is classified as a personality disorder, and is often presented in people who already have antisocial personality disorder, which Christine was displaying a lot of symptoms of by this point, and while she was never officially diagnosed with Munchausen syndrome, her symptoms and behaviors are unmistakable. Over the course of two years, she would visit the hospital 50 times with mysterious ailments that doctors could never figure out the root cause of. A lot of her symptoms would be super obscure or minor, she would say she was bitten by a snake, or she was bleeding, which would end up ultimately just being her period, then she would go to multiple different hospitals with similar stories, which is also a classic sign of having Munchausen syndrome. Research shows that someone coming from an abusive household is much more likely to develop this syndrome so they can receive the attention they aren't getting from anywhere else, or the specific person they want. And the reason this is linked to antisocial personality disorder, is because people who have antisocial personalities, are extremely manipulative and they take pleasure in being able to manipulate people, specifically authority figures like doctors. It gives them a sense of control and makes them feel like they're smarter than everybody else. And the fact that she started harming animals so young, also gives an indicator as to what her future might have been, due to the fact that almost all violent crime perpetrators have a history of animal abuse or neglect in their childhood. In fact, children who witness domestic violence even if the violence isn't directed towards them, they just see it between their parents. 30% of those children act out the violence they see on their own pets. They feel like they are gaining control of their own lives, and taking power back from a turbulent situation by inflicting pain on something that's weaker than they are. This is also probably why Christine chose the profession of being a babysitter, 
because oddly enough she didn't even like children. But of course the only people who knew this dark side of Christine were her adoptive parents and her immediate family. Nobody in her neighborhood or her community had any idea what was going on in her mind, or the dark and twisted thoughts she was having. The only thing they saw was this innocent 17-year-old they felt they could trust with their children. And after Jeffrey suddenly passes away from his natural illness of myocarditis, his funeral is held three days later. All of Jeffrey's family attended including the Spring family whose son Joseph was the same age as Jeffrey. And as Joseph was so young, the Spring family didn't think taking him to a funeral was the best idea. They thought he should stay home while they grieved Jeffrey's loss. So the Spring family decides to hire Christine to look after their two-year-old son, and while the funeral is in session, another 911 call is made. Two-year-old Joseph has suddenly died, his official cause of death, also myocarditis. But even after being involved with the deaths of three toddlers, two from the same family three days apart, suspicions around Christine were not raised, even though it seems like death follows her wherever she goes, and she was also the last person in every single case to see these children alive. After the deaths of the latest toddlers, Christine once again, decides that she needs another fresh start, so she decides to move to Perry, Florida in 1981 where she becomes a housekeeper of 77-year-old William Swindle, and literally the same day she starts working for William, he is found collapsed and unresponsive on his kitchen floor. He was pronounced dead at the scene and when he was transported to the hospital, hospital staff listed his cause of death as a heart attack. They didn't even bother to do any tests they just assumed, oh he's 77, heart attack, natural causes, once again shifting the focus away from Christine. Then just a few weeks after William's death, Christine goes with her stepsister to a doctor's appointment for her stepsister's eight-month-old daughter. She was getting routine vaccines, and after the appointment was finished, they went to the store to go pick up some diapers, and since it was just going to be a quick errand, Christine decided she would just stay in the car with her niece until her stepsister got back. However, when her stepsister comes out of the store, Christine tells her that they need to go to the emergency room right away, as her daughter has suddenly stopped breathing. The medical staff would do everything they could to try and save Christine's niece, but she was pronounced dead at the ER. Doctors said the cause of death was most likely due to a bad reaction to the vaccines she had just had a couple hours prior. They said that while vaccines are normally safe, Sometimes things like this just happen and this was just one of those tragic and unlucky cases, so once again, the cause of death is ruled to be of natural causes and no one looks further into the case. And even after leaving a line of grief behind her and taking the life of her own niece, Christine decided that this still wasn't enough, and June 20, 1982, she starts babysitting nine-week-old Travis Cook, and while he's in her care, he too all of a sudden starts having difficulty breathing, Travis's parents managed to get him to the hospital in time where he was in the NICU for over a week. After Travis was stable and healthy enough to go home, he was finally released, where he was again put into the care of Christine. Then he too that same day would end up dead. Due to the confusing chain of events, Travis's parents decided that they wanted an autopsy done. They just couldn't understand how he could have suddenly died when he was doing so much better, and was even healthy enough to go home. And it was during this autopsy that for the first time all eyes turned to Christine, as it was revealed that Travis died from suffocation. Christine was an immediate suspect as she was the last person in both occasions to be with Travis, and as soon as Christine was brought in for questioning, in exchange for not receiving the death penalty, she agreed to confess to all of her crimes. In the interrogation, she said her motive was that she heard voices telling her to kill the children and she decided to do it by smothering them, which she learned to do by watching TV. She was so proud of this when she was telling detectives because she added her own little twist to it. She made her own technique by instead of using pillows like she saw on TV she just covered the kids' faces with a blanket and waited for them to die. 
After police began their investigation into Christine, they thought it was hard to believe that no one raised any suspicions regarding her connection to all the deaths, but apparently the first victim, Cassidy's doctor, when he noticed the injuries to her head, he thought Christine's story of Cassidy falling out of the crib just didn't make sense, and he contacted authorities about foul play. He sent a letter telling them about his suspicions that this was not a natural death, but the police department has no record of receiving such a letter, which is what led to the case being dropped and forgotten. After confessing to murdering the toddlers that she babysat, she plead guilty to murdering three of them and got two consecutive life sentences. A couple of years into her sentence is when she would finally admit to killing 77-year-old William Swindle. She was also eligible for parole in 2007 at the age of 44, but she was denied. And to this day her story about why she took these innocent lives kept changing. She initially said it's because she heard a voice in her head, then it was because she was super irritated because the kids just wouldn't stop crying and they wouldn't be quiet. Then she also claimed that sometimes, she would just be bored, and she wanted something to do and so murder just seemed like a fun outlet for her. Either way I hope she spends the rest of her life in prison, as she is far too dangerous to be released.